name is George Mkandawire, and uh, welcome to the Father's Table. We've been dealing with the issue of faith. Last week we dealt with the issue of uh, a first fruit company that the Lord is going to raise or is raising in the earth. And um, we are intent on becoming that which the Lord has purposed to release in the earth. And what a time to be alive in this day and age, to see that which the Lord is going to do in the earth through a people like you and I. We live in such exciting times, times where if we choose to obey what God wants us to do, then we will live through a different economy. We are on earth, but remember the scripture says we are not of the earth. So the economy that will sustain us will not be the earthly economy. It will be the economy from above. We will not be functioning from our connections. We will not be functioning from what we have worked for, but will begin to operate from above. And as we begin to operate from above, we will begin to see what God is able to do to a people that are foolish enough to trust God. And um, this morning, what I would like to do is very simple. I, I'm, I'm trying to speak out of to you from my heart. And I tried to put down something, but just couldn't, so I left it. But the thing that came into my mind I was, as I was pondering and thinking about what I'm going to say to you today is the fact that God has already raised examples. Examples that have lived before us. Examples that you even find in scriptures. And... Uh, those examples that lived before us were in a way presenting to us a picture of what a corporate body can experience, but they experienced it as individuals. And I'm going to use one person in particular Probably I shouldn't say one person in particular, but the ministry of one person in particular, and this one person being Elisha. I want us to track Elisha and see where, what happened to him, where we begin to see him, and what is going on with this guy called Elisha. Uh, so I'm going to read from 2 Kings. Let's pick it up in 2 Kings. Let's see. Let's see. Where should I begin? And chapter number 4, I think, would be the best. Uh, so I'm going to read from 2 Kings. Let's pick it up in 2 Kings. Let's see. Where should I begin? And chapter number 4, I think, would be the best place to start. Verse number 1. Let's put this nicely here. Now, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. 
And now that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. Verse 2. Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me. Then, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maid servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow vessels at large for yourselves from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all vessels or into all these vessels and you shall set aside what is full. Very interesting. So she went from him and shut the door from behind. For, uh, so he, she went from him and shut the door behind her and said, and her and her children, and they were bringing the vessels to her and say, and she poured. Verse number six. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, this for me, I think it's one of the saddest portions of scripture that I read. But this is what she said. Bring me another vessel. She said, and she said to her, oh sorry, and he said to her, there is none, one, there's not one vessel more. And watch what happened. Then the oil stopped. Then she came and told the man of God and said, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on the rest. So the first story that we find is of Elisha multiplying the oil or causing the multiplication of the oil of this lady that was a widow of a student of Elisha. There is no precedent set up before this that you hear of something that is multiplying like this. So the ministry of Elisha begins to paint a picture of multiplication of stuff. But he had to believe, Elisha had to believe that it's doable, it's possible. He didn't care whether he had heard someone behind or before him multiplying stuff or getting things multiplied like this. He just didn't care. For him, he, he is uh, breaking new ground. So he asks the lady, to go do this and those were the results and for me this is a picture that in the future there will be a company of believers that will break new ground that will begin to do things that are up until now or hitherto not experienced but they become common occurrences that's why i'm saying you are living in very exciting times in times when you will experience what God will do at a much higher level because we are many will experience what God wants to do in an unprecedented manner let's follow this man further verse number eight now there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunem where there was a prominent woman and she persuaded him to eat food and so it was as often as he passed by 
he turned in there to eat food. Verse 9, she said to her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God passing by continually. Please let us make a little walled upper chamber and let us set a bed for him. Uh, sorry, let us set a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand and it shall be when he comes to us that he can turn in there. Verse 11. One day he came there and turned into the upper chamber and rested. Then he said to Gehaz, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. He said to him, Say now to her, Behold, you have been careful for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Would you be spoken to, eh? would you spoken for to the king or to the captain of the army? And she answered, I live among my own people. So she said, what then is to be done for her? And Gaius answered, truly, she has no son, and her husband is old. Then, verse number 15, he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway, and he said, At this season next year, you will embrace a son. Now a son is being imposed upon this woman. And then she said, Nay, no. My Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. So that was her response. It's not possible what you are saying. Don't lie to me. Verse 17. The woman conceived and bore a son at that season, the next year, as Elisha had said to her. There again you see something unprecedented how God used Elisha to tell this lady that, don't worry, next year, same time, mark, put it on your calendar. On this, the anniversary of my visit next year, you will have a baby. We don't care about the situation, we don't care about the circumstances, we don't care about whatever. This will happen and I'm saying it as a man of God. I'm speaking it into the atmosphere. I'm declaring it that it shall be. It shall come to pass. Uh, I, I am bringing a creative um, thing that will manifest. You will have a baby. I am translating from the intangible world to the tangible world, from the world that you can't touch things to a world that I'm transferring a child from the heavenlies to the earthly for you and it doesn't matter who says what it shall happen by next year same time and voila oh, voila. there we go my, a little bit of my French there it happened the child was born he spoke it and when he spoke it it was established in the heavens and the Lord made sure it happened. We live in times when what you will say, if it is according to the word of God, will come to pass. Not because you are special, but because God wants to put in the earth a people, a company of believers who he will use to say if this could happen to Elisha it can equally happen to a larger group of people that was just a foretest what we will experience will be the real eating of the food it won't be a testing anymore it will be the, the fullness 
of the manifestation of that which was started in the ministry of Elisha. Let me move on. Then, verse number 18, when the child had, was grown, the day came that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head, and he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. When he had spoken, taken him and brought him to his mother, he set her, he said, he sat on her lap until noon, then died. Next verse 21. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and return. Then he said, Why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon no Sabbath. And she said, it will be well. It doesn't sound to me that this woman has told the husband what has happened. Because if she had mentioned that the son is dead, he would not have asked, asked the question, why are you going to see the prophet now? But anyway, she ends up saying, it will be fine. You will understand better. <laughs> then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slow down. Uh, do not slow down the pace for me unless I tell you. So he went, she went and came to the man of God to Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw at a distance, he said to Gehaz, his servant, Behold, there is the Shunammite. Looks like this man has got perfect sight as well. Please run to now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your house, with your husband? Is it well with your child? And guess what she says? It is well. Wow. You just lost a baby and you're saying it is well. God have mercy. <clears throat> Verse 27. When she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught hold of his feet. And Gaius came near to push her away. But the man of God said to her, and the man of God said, let her alone. For her soul is troubled within her, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. And she said, Did I ask for a son from my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehaz, that's Elijah, Elisha, I beg your pardon, Get up your loins and take my stuff in your hand and go your way. If you meet any man, do not salute him. And so it sounds like from the two uh, conversations that I'm picking, the lady tells her servant, don't talk to someone along the way. So it soon seems to me like when they started talking, they, they spoke for long. They would greet like Africans. How uh, I was talking to someone this week and... Uh, <laughs> Excuse me. This person told me how they greet outside, and um, when they go inside the house, they greet again. Then they greet concerning everything. How are the children? How are the dogs? How are your cats? And uh, etc. That's probably how this was going. <laughs> but let's move on. So don't salute. Do not answer him and lay my stuff on the lad's face. Verse 30, the mother of the lad said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, 
I will not leave you. And he arose and followed her. Then Gehazi passed before or before them and laid the stuff on the face, the lad's face, but there was no sound or response. So he turned to meet him and told him, the lad has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, behold, the lad was dead and laid on his bed. So he entered and shut the door behind them both and prayed to the Lord. He went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands and he stretched himself upon him and the flesh of the child became warm. <clears throat> he then, uh, then he returned and walked in the house back, uh, in the house once back and forth and went up and stretched himself on him and the lad sneezed seven times and the lad opened his eyes. And he, and he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when he, she came in to him, he said, Take up your son. There's something that I once heard, and I think if I remember properly, it was spoken by Dr. Uh, uh, Segi Governor. And I've never forgotten what he said. In this story, we keep hearing of the lad, the lad, the lad. But when it is, Elisha is finished and he is now presenting the child who has been referred to as the lad throughout, he took up this child and said, watch this, verse number 36. Take up your son. So when he is finished dealing with the lad, it was a lad that died. But when he is finished, it was a son that was presented. So may God help us that we become a people that will also begin to operate just as Elisha operated. And now, okay, here we go. Verse 37 now. And she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and she took up her son again, second instance of a son, and went out. Again, here is Elisha who is being used to raise a, to raise a dead child. And how he does it is he imposes himself on him, on the child, on the lad. He lies on top of him, mouth to mouth, eye to eye, contact is taking place. Uh, that which he speaks is taking place, is moving from him to, to the child. How he sees things is moving from him to the child and then the child becomes a son, a mature individual. But that's not where I'm going. Where I'm going is the fact that this miracle took place. And the fact that this miracle took place for an individual, to me, paints a picture. Excuse me. To me, paints a picture that there's going to be a company of believers who will experience this. This, this will become a norm for those. They will be foolish enough and trusting God for such a thing to happen. Let me give you an example. Um, I was in Blanta at the time, but running a school in Lilongwe, Malawi. And I carried a young man. And this young man, when we, we got to Lilongwe, of course he vanished since he was a student, he was amongst his peers, and I was at the computer. There, there used to be a place where uh, you could go and hire a computer. 
for surfing. So I went in and I took an hour and seated next to me was a gentleman and we spoke for a while. And I was asking him, he was also my student, so I'm asking him how things are at his house and he says, no, things are fine. I'm just talking to my wife now to find out how things are and she says all is well. Is well. So we finished there, went back to our rooms, I was resting and I remember there was this frantic knock on the door. And I opened and I saw a large group of people. I was on the first floor and the large group of people was down on the ground level. And they were pointing at my room. He's there, he's there. I'm thinking, what happened? And say, please come and see. So I walked down and went to the loo. And when I entered, I found this man, the one that was sitting next to me in the cafeteria where we were uh, or into, in the uh, computer room and we were, where we were chatting. He has fallen. He's facing up, but he has foam on his, all over the nose and mouth. But the foam that had developed has even dried it's dried up so i reached over for a pulse to feel the pulse felt on the neck nothing on the palm nothing so i remember saying to the person that came and told me to come and see to say go get a nurse as well as go get a police officer because this will be a police case but unknown to me was that when I entered into this loo to see what had happened, this gentleman that I had traveled with, the young man that I had traveled with, came with me, walked in with me, but I didn't see him. And then I went out stood waiting for the nurse and waiting for a police officer. So the police officer and the nurse came at the same time, walked in, and as we walked in, here we found this young man in that room and he's praying. And it hit me. George, you didn't even pray. Your first reaction was call for uh, a nurse and call for a police officer. It didn't even come into your mind to say what you can do, God. What can you do, God, in this situation? And here is someone that you are training. He's foolish enough to pray to ask God to intervene. For sure, nothing happened, but the mere fact that he made an attempt to pray in such a situation has always stood for me. And the young man, God uses mightily, I'm not mentioning names here, but he uses mightily because he was foolish enough Yes, in that one instance, nothing happened. But in the many other instances thereafter, things have happened with that young man. I am talking to you to activate that kind of foolishness, that kind of trust, that kind of belief, that kind of conviction that says it's a hopeless situation absolutely no question about it but I'm still going to ask God and see what God will do in this situation so this lady receives a son that had died because Elisha has done this thing that we've never seen anyone doing it and it's a picture that there will be a company of believers coming that will experience this in an exponential manner, in a way that has never been seen before, 
and this that I am doing now as Elisha, that I'm experiencing as Elisha, will become the norm for those people. So may you begin to develop appetite for things like this. May you begin to develop the sense in you that says, I'm not giving up until God tells me to. It feels like it's a hopeless case, but it's okay. I'm still going to pray. I remember hearing a story, I never saw it, but I, I, I heard about it, of a man, he is now in Cape Town. Also, I'm not mentioning names, that should suffice. And this man was on a bus, and there was a gentleman that was trying to get on a bus, but was trying to get on a bus before the bus has come to a complete standstill. So the bus knocked the gentleman. And uh, they are saying, uh, when, when the uh, ambulance came, they declared him dead on the scene. So there's nothing we can do, the guy's gone. And this gentleman says to, to, to the paramedics, just give me a moment. They'll say, what, what are you doing? Say, I just want to pray. So pray for what? The guy is dead. Say, hold on. Just, if you just allow me, give me a moment. And he goes for it. He prays for the gentleman, the dead gentleman. And the next thing, the dead gentleman coughs and he starts living again. He's back to life. I'm saying it's possible. It's doable. Um, the last example I want to give you is uh, of a gentleman in Peter, not Peter Marisbeck, in Durban. Um, a young man. And uh, they, they were having church. And a helicopter that was carrying this sick person developed a fault and it landed close to the just outside where they were having prayers so he as a pastor went to them to see what what is the helicopter doing here and they found them resuscitating the person they can't now fly because the, the aeroplane has, de, uh, the plane has developed a problem and there they are trying to resuscitate the person. And they say, we, we were transporting this person to the hospital and now the plane has developed a problem and is now, this person is gone. And we are doing all we can to keep him so that at least we can try. And then the, one of the paramedics is saying, this is it. We've tried long enough. We'll just now pronounce the death time or time of death. And just before he writes, he feels, pray for this guy. And he says, hold on, don't write that. Let, let me, you write after I'm done. Let me pray for this guy. But the guy is gone. It's finished. He said, no, let me pray. So he prays. And again, the man begins to began to, to breathe again. It's, it's possible to begin to say what has happened in these snippets is simply an announcement to that company of believers, to that first fruit company, a company that will emerge that is telling those people this was just a foretest. Wait until you experience the fullness that will appear in 2022, 2023, and beyond. And he's dealing with you, he's talking about you guys, talking about us. We can begin to have this because this is children's bread. We are not begging for something that is not ours. Can you believe my time? Let me go. Let me just... How do I do this? Read one more. Let me just read one more. Verse 38. 
When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servants, Put on a large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his full his lap full of wild girds and came and sliced them into the pot of the stew for they did not know what they were. So they poured it out for the men to eat and as they were eating of the stew they cried out and said oh man of God there is death in the pot and they were unable to eat but he said now bring meal or flour and threw it into the pot and said pour it out for the people that they may eat then there was no harm in the pot now a man, okay, I guess let's stop there. So here again, something poisonous is found in their food. And the people are not able to eat because it's poisonous, it's bitter, whatever it could have been. And they cried out, there is um, death in the pot. And all that Elisha does is he asks for flour and he puts some flour into the pot and he tells them mix it up and dish out to, for the people. We've just healed this meal. <laughs> it's amazing. I think just like that, absolutely. And when the people eat, no one dies, no repercussions. And I am saying, when this happened, it is foretelling of what will happen in the future, where people will do unprecedented things. I'm not talking about foolish stuff like causing the people to eat snakes, drink, causing them to drink poison, etc., etc. That's, that's nonsense. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about raising a people that will believe God. And when God gives an instruction, we will take it at face value. We will not begin to, what's the word that I'm looking for? To discuss, to pull God on the side and say, listen, you don't understand. No, God knows. Just take the flower, just put it in there, Mix it up and dish for the people and the rest you will see what God will do. Deliver a meal from death. One more, then we are done for the day. Now a man came from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of 20 fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack and he said give them to the people that they may eat <coughs> excuse me his attendant said what will I sit before a hundred men so now we are told how many they are hundred people hundred men twenty loaves of bread Okay, let me read as it is. His attendant said, What? Will I set this before a hundred men? But he said, Give them to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left over. Like, what? <laughs> I'll never forget. Uh, again, I'll try and avoid using names here. <clears throat> But I can say where we were. We were in a place called Morogoro. And uh, we had just finished our sessions for the day. And uh, 
there's I, I know for sure there is one on this uh, who is here today that was with me and we went out and had uh, a meal outside and it was a lot of meat a lot of meat and uh, not only was there a lot of meat there was also a lot of uh, ugali pap nshima I'm using those terms for those that are in different locations so there was a lot of it and we were about six or eight i can't remember exactly how many we were and man i was assured there's going to be food left over but absolutely with these eight six or eight men we consumed everything that was there that was the problem with this guy say i know how these hundred men eat these 20 loaves will mean absolute nothing for these men and then he says the lord said there will be leftovers can you imagine let's read on <clears throat> Verse 44, so he said it before them, and they ate, and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. Amazing. You see, again, we read it in history that this is what happened, but it's a foretest. It's just put in there for us, the people upon whom the ends of the earth are come. Uh, we are the ones to get this word and to take this word and to begin to live with it because it's what God wants done in this day and age. There has to be a people like you and I that will see what we are reading and provoke us and say, if this happened to him, then surely it can equally happen to me. Let me just push you a little bit. And this is how I'm going to push you. If Elisha had the presence of God, the spirit of God, then I would like to ask a question. Was the spirit in Elisha different from the spirit that operates in you? If the answer is no, then the effects of what happened or caused what happened should equally be in you to cause things to happen. If the God behind Elisha is the same God behind you, then it is not foolish to say if he has done it once, he can do it again. If he has done it to someone, he can do it even now. He hasn't changed. Or he hasn't chosen to change. He hasn't, God has not decided to belittle himself in 2023 and uplift himself in the time of Elisha. He's still the same God. The only difference is there was an Elisha who would trust that when God speaks, he takes a step. And he, there is a George in 2023 who hears God whisper to him, but he does not take the step of faith just as an Elisha did. And that's what I'm trying to break. To say, when God says it, it doesn't matter how it looks, how foolish it looks. God will be able to defend his word. There has to come a company of people that will be able to say, that which was written is now manifesting in our lives, in our lifetime. We are seeing it. We are bearing witness to the things that were once written and they still happen in 2023 this and i'm not finished but time is gone is what i felt i needed us to hear because there is a time 
This is the time that God wants to provoke us to say, if he was faithful then, he's going to be faithful now. If he could do stuff then, he can still do stuff now. If he was trustable then, he's still trustable now. If he was powerful then, he's going to still be powerful today. It just, he's just waiting for you to make a decision to say, will I trust him? And we've got a precedence. God set a precedence that we can look at and say, he did it here for these guys, for an Elisha. He didn't have something to refer to. He had absolutely no one that he could look back and say, listen, I saw someone do this. I heard this what happened there, therefore, because it happened then, I'm, a, I'm going to trust God so that it can also happen to me. He had Elijah, but certain things Elijah didn't do, and we didn't study on Elijah. So, what am I saying? In 2023, can you become foolish enough to trust God and allow God to be God and when he asks you or tells you to do something to be foolish enough to trust him I'll stop right there and grace and peace to you I'll see you in the next episode